Welcome to the Better Than I Found It podcast. I'm your host, Mike McGraw, the men's golf coach at Baylor. And today I have a very special Baylor guest, and that is head women's golf coach, Jay Goebel. Jay and his team have been in the midst of a historical run this fall, uh, winning all three tournaments, uh, two of them by double digits, a great, great stretch, having one of the best seasons in the history of Baylor women's golf. And I just want to catch up with Jay and let you all kind of find out his story, how he got to Baylor, and and also uh, just all about this magical fall season they just had. So let's get to the interview with Jay Goble. Good morning, Jay Goble, and welcome to Better Than I Found It. Good morning, Coach McGraw. Thanks for uh, having me all the way down the hall here. <laughs> it's not a long walk. You didn't no, have to go far. 50 steps or so. Yeah, we're right here in the confines of my office at the, the Billy W. Williams Golf Practice Facility and Clubhouse. And uh, my guest today is Jay Goble, our women's golf coach here at Baylor. And Jay, you guys are on a historic run this fall uh, of 2020. But before we talk about that, and I want to talk a lot about that today, uh, let's just kind of get you to Baylor. How did you get to Baylor? What's your background? A, a lot of people don't know that story. And honestly, I know some of it, but not all of it. So you grew up in North Carolina. I know that. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Concord, North Carolina, which is a suburb of Charlotte. It's about 30 miles uh, north of, of Charlotte. And uh, Did you play a lot of junior golf or not? I did not. I didn't start playing golf. I, I was listening to Troy Denton the other day, and I felt like we had a pretty similar story. <laughs> I, I played every other sport until... Uh, you know, I was probably 14 years old and sitting around with my dad who played a lot of golf and he's like, Hey, let's go play. Uh, let's go play at the club today. And I, I wanted to play basketball or tennis or something else. And Jay, you're, um, you're my height. Why were you yeah. wanting to play basketball? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was actually tall when I was younger. Oh, okay. But, well, um, okay. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, my dad's like, it, I was just bored one summer day and we went out to the uh to the golf club and my dad's like we're gonna play 18 holes and keep score and uh I'd never played a round of golf before and we played and I I remember distinctly to this day I parred 10 11 and 12 in a row mm. and my dad's like you you're not I mean I don't know how you made three pars in a row it's pretty good and I uh, really enjoyed the day, and it was obviously the middle of summer before my high school year and, and uh, my freshman year in high school. So I went out the next day with a friend of mine who I knew played golf, and I shot 92, the second round First of golf. First full round of golf? The second round of golf second that, round, yeah. that I ever played, I shot 92. Okay. So, so I was like, oh, I think this is pretty fun. I'm enjoying this. And uh you know, I played at a golf course called Kannapolis Country Club. It's called uh, the club at Irish Creek now. And I, I had the golf bug, and I played every day for about 10 years after that. <laughs> was it one of those deals where mom would p take you to the golf course yeah. right after breakfast and yeah. you'd stay there all day? Yeah, so both my parents worked at Philip Morris in uh, Concord, North Carolina there. And, uh, yeah, my mom would take me in the summertime, 6.30 in the morning before she had to go to work. And... Uh, Usually she'd pick me up, you know, after after she was done and we we're getting ready for dinner at six, seven o'clock at night. And I'd stay there all day and play golf, hit balls, swim in the pool a little bit. I mean, it, I made a day of it pretty has much every ever, day. Has there ever been a better babysitter no. than a golf course? No, never. Out as safe and, a spot as a kid could go. And I, you know, I think about those days and they were, uh, I mean... You know, I was the luckiest kid in the world in the fact that uh, I got to go play golf every day, be around friends. I, I think I learned a lot about, uh, you know, socializing with people. Like, again, you know, when you're on a golf course and you're a 15-year-old kid, uh, most of the people that you play golf with are, you know, 45, 55-year-old businessmen in the community. And, and uh, you know, I think that it was it was a great experience all around for me growing up in, in North Carolina there. So you, you did you end up playing golf in high school or not? I did. I played golf in high school. I played at Northwest Cabarrus High School. And then, uh, you know, I after one year of playing golf, I was already about a zero handicap. So um, I and I still, you know, do this to the this day. I play a ton of golf. And, oh, no, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I played a ton of golf back then. Um I literally tried to figure it out one day, and I think I played about 
every single day for 10 years. The first 10 years of my golfing career, I played nine to 18 holes every day. Wow. So that's amazing. Yeah. I, I, you know, I had that same, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but so anyway, you ended up going to North Carolina, Charlotte to play. I actually went to uh coastal Carolina. Okay. For, coastal. Uh-huh. Yeah. I went there for a year and a half. Um, I walked on the golf team there. Uh, Todd McCorkle was my, my golf coach at, at, uh, coastal and, uh, he had walk on tryouts because he was the new coach there. And I, I won the walk on tryouts and he gave me a spot on the team, but, uh, you know, I think when I got to college, I realized that, uh, you know, I might have been a, a decent player in Concord, North Carolina. But as you as you get to a Division One school and you see that, you know, everybody's pretty good. And I think I was a little intimidated. And again, I'd only been playing golf four or five years at that point. And uh, so I did not continue to play at Coastal Carolina. I stayed there for a year and a half. And then uh Finished out my last three years at UNC Charlotte, which is only about 25 minutes from my house that I grew up at. I got you. So, and after that, you uh, you graduated from college. Did mm-hmm. you play golf much, or did what did you do after Man, that? Man, I, I tried to play for a minute. Um, I would, a minute? That's yeah, not a very long yeah, career. It wasn't, it wasn't very long. I, I distinctly remember my very first professional event was at a course down in Orlando called Ridgewood Lakes. It's near where my parents live uh, in Haines City there. And I go out my very first professional event and shoot 12 under for three rounds. And I was like, wow, that's pretty that's good. Good. 12 under par. Um, Larry Rinker was playing in the field. I think he shot 20 under par. And there was about 15 guys between me and Larry Rinker uh, in that tournament. So, um, you know, again, I think that that really – it was almost like being a freshman in high in college again to where it's like, wow, you know, I thought I was good, but I got a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, I think the difficulty of a professional golf life is, is tough. Um, you know, traveling, staying in hotels with a bunch of people, probably not eating your best, probably not working out the way you need to, or keeping your body in good enough shape to play. And, um, yeah, I was, I, I, honestly, I got a little homesick too, like as I was traveling and, and, uh, decided to, to move back, uh, to Myrtle beach, South Carolina, which is where my wife, she was my girlfriend at the yeah. time was. And, uh, so moved back to Myrtle beach and worked at a golf course for a little while. And well, eventually you get yeah. into, into in golf instruction. So how yes. did you get, tell me how that kind of came about. So it's pretty funny. My wife is from Bradenton, Florida. And uh, that is where, it, back then it was called the David Ledbetter Junior Golf Academy. Uh, now it's called IMG Academies. And it was funny, when I first started dating my wife, I was like, yeah, I'd really like to work there someday. Like, I, I, I had, an, obviously, an interest in golf and an interest in golf instruction. And my wife, who was from Bradenton, was like, there's no, like, we can't be together because there's no way I ever want to move back to Bradenton, Florida. <laughs> I don't want to live there. She grew up in a house that, honestly, you could hit a pitching wedge into the David Ledbetter Golf Academy. And uh, she was like, there's no way I want to move back there. And I was like, wow, that I think that might actually be like a dream job for me to go and work there. And uh the story on how I actually started to work there is I was working at another golf course and Gary Gilchrist, who was the director of the Academy at the time had brought a really good junior golfer out to the club I was working at. And he invited me to play golf with him. And during that round of golf, you know, Gary played at Texas A&M and it was a great player. Uh, The player that he brought with him ended up playing at Georgia uh, I went out with him that day and shot 66 and he was, <laughs> he was like, D- do you want to keep working in this golf shop or do you want to, you know, like we could really use somebody that knows how to play golf, um, at the Academy. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm totally interested in coming to work at IMG. And, um, it was really funny. He offered me a job almost on the spot there. So I show up uh, my first day a couple weeks later to work at IMG, and I have like these really nice silk pants on, nice golf shirt, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, he hands me the key to the tractor to pick the range balls that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, you know, I think I, I probably thought I was going to show up that day and start teaching 
Julieta Granada and sure. and uh, you know Casey Wittenberg and David Gossett. I thought you know I was I was going to go spread some knowledge to them, and I ended up picking the range for six months, which was an interesting experience as well. I think that was humbling enough, just yeah. enough to get, to get you to appreciate it <laughs> yeah. later. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, so if you worked at Ledbetter for how long? Five years. Five years, and then yeah. you got a job at University of Florida as an yeah. assistant coach. I did. With how did you get that job? That's interesting. No, that was that was. Uh, I would say that I never thought that I'd be a women's golf coach. That was not anywhere in my career plans or career path that I would have dreamed of twenty years ago. But as I was working at IMG, um, I had a I had a group of of young girls that I was teaching. They were anywhere from ten to fifteen years old at the time, and uh they all ended up to be really great players and and I started working with them when they were really young and and by the time they were 15 16 17 uh they were all being recruited by Florida Duke Stanford uh Wake Forest and Michigan I mean they were all being recruited very hard and the funny thing is is in the the summer of 2008 I started getting recruited to be an assistant coach because they wanted to get the players that I was recruiting or that, that I sense. was teaching. That makes yeah. Sense. So, um, I had two opportunities in 2008. I, I, um, was being recruited to be the assistant coach at Florida and was being recruited to be the assistant women's coach at Wake Forest for Diane Daly. So, um, obviously being from North Carolina, I had a lot of interest in that. Um, I knew coach Daly had been there you know, for a long time, she coached there for over 30 years and had a great, um, great reputation for, for having really good teams. But my wife went to university of Florida. Um, my wife actually had a really good job in Sarasota. So I think, uh, at the beginning, this was kind of going to be an experiment. It was going to be like, Hey, go up to Gainesville, be the coach for a year. If you like it, then we'll figure it out. But if you don't like it, you can come back here and work at Ledbetter and I'll keep my job in Sarasota. So I think uh, obviously the rest is history. After that, I, I did enjoy coaching and, and being in college golf. And um, so, yeah, starting in 2008, I, I started coaching so for the Gators. It's, it's a 12-year experience. <laughs> it's, experiment. A, it's a 12-year experiment yeah. so far. I, I think it's going pretty well, actually. <laughs> so it's great. Well, let, okay, so you're here at Baylor now. Yes. And you've been here since? 2011. 2011. And? Let's just talk a little bit before we get to the fall of 2020. Uh, in your about your third or fourth year, you guys had an incredible run in the spring of 2015. Yes. I think everybody that loves Baylor athletics remembers it, but you guys won the Big 12 championship. Yes, yes, we did. And then went on to a great finish at the NCAA. Talk about that spring a little bit. You know, that spring was, was uh, you know, it went by in a second. You know, when you're when you're playing good golf like that, like I do remember it all very well, but I, I do remember also how quickly it went by. Um, we had a solid team. We knew that Dylan Kim was going to come in January of 2015, which was, uh, you know, she was a top 10 ranked player in the country. Everybody and, needs a mid-year trans <laughs> or a person like that. That's a yeah. great addition. Well, you know, I think... I've had a lot of mid-year players come in and, and I think that it is a really good thing to have for a team to come in, break up the monotony a little bit. Uh, somebody that, you know, again, can make the, the back end of your lineup work harder and, and know that they need to work hard to keep their spot. Um, Dylan Kim came in and, and honestly, like the very first event in Palos Verdes, which is the best field in women's golf, she goes out and finishes third. So, I knew she was going to be good. I, I don't know that I expected her to play that well right away. And, you know, we go out, we're ranked uh, at the beginning of that year after our first tournament or when the first rankings came out, we were ranked 121st in the country. Okay. And, uh, but I knew we were better than that because during the fall, we had a couple flashes of brilliance where we had, you know, we shot 273 in a round. Um, we, we would have a good round or a good two rounds, but never really put it together and kind of knew that Dylan might've been the missing piece to that. Um, when we went to our first tournament of the year at Palos Verdes, which again is 
a national championship field. It's USC, UCLA, Florida, Duke, Georgia. I mean, it's always like the best teams in women's golf. We were, <laughs> when I looked at the leaderboard, we were the only ones without a ranking on the side. Okay. So we were outside the top 50 when we went to the event and ended up winning that event. Mm. So uh, after we went from being, again, outside the top 50 to winning Palos Verdes, I think I knew we had a pretty amazing team. And we just kind of had to feel our way out with, with how to coach them and, and what the... What the um, kind of the best play was going to be to to keep them going. And we had some growing pains throughout that fall because, uh, you know, we went to, and we, we were talking about this the other day, but we went to Hawaii and we finished fourth on a really easy golf course, uh, Kaneohe Clipper or whatever. Yeah, I know that course. And, and, and I think that looking back, we were there, you know, we were kind of there to go on vacation. We weren't really there to play golf. <laughs> and... uh we kind of had some aha moments on, on what worked for us through Connie Oe Clipper. And then um, we kind of figured out at Arizona State that if my assistant coach at the time, Mary Michael Maggio, would walk with Dylan Kim, then um, we could see some pretty amazing results out of her. Because we we're at Arizona State, which is right before the Big 12 championship, and we had a bad first round. Dylan Kim had a bad first round. And uh, I asked Coach Maggio, I'm like, just just go just go walk with her the rest of the tournament. See if you can kind of keep her hitting one shot at a time and, and getting out of her own way a little bit. And Dylan, from that point forward, I, I mean, I don't know if Dylan really shot over par the rest of the year. She shot basically between 67 and 72 for the rest of the year. And um, then going into the Big 12 Championship. Where was that played, by the way? I've... That was played at the Dominion in okay. San Antonio. So we played down there, and uh, I'm not a scoreboard watcher. I feel that uh, most of the time I leave my phone either in my backpack or somewhere where I don't look at it. I just I feel like it's it's better for me personally to not know where the scores are or what happened the whole before I don't want it to change my, my thoughts or my feelings uh, when I'm talking to my players, so I don't really look at it. And I remember um, seeing our sport administrator, uh, Paul Bradshaw, on like the 15th hole of the last round, and he just looks over at me and he goes, Jay, you can look at your phone now. I think you guys are <laughs> going to be okay because we had pretty much routed everybody that, that weekend. I think we ended up winning by 15 or 16 shots for the week, and um we had great performances by everybody on the team. I mean, we our five player Lauren White. We even counted. She shot seventy one in the second round. Counted her score. Um, but the main four players that that counted that whole year: uh, Haley Davis, Giovanna Maimon, uh, Laura Lenardi, and Dylan Kim. They they played great, literally from Arizona State all the way through nationals. Well, let's get to nationals. That, yeah, that that yeah. is probably. As I look back on it, one of the most controversial courses that that, that <laughs> national championship for the women has been played on because of the difficulty factor. Yeah. It was such a hard golf course, yeah. and that I don't know if that played into your hands or not. When what did you think going into the event? So I think it did. Um, one thing that you know that was the first time for match play for uh, women's golf at that time, and and. You know, I I think that we decided to do something very different in preparation for that event. We, you know, I I hear, I'm hearing rumblings about other teams like, you know, playing all this golf and playing all these matches and and everything. And as usual, we had probably 10 days to prepare and then go to, to Bradenton, Florida to play in that. And, uh, I had decided that we're going to play nine holes a day. Um, we're going to play golf. We're going to play nine holes every single day before we get there. But besides that, we're going to be like the most fresh. I think, you know, we just come off winning regionals, shot 22 under par regionals. Our games are really good. So we, we just need to maintain what we're doing and kind of be fresh for the event. So, you know, again, I hear of a lot of teams playing 36 hole matches and trying to do all these match play things. And I'm like, I know Bradenton's going to be hot. I know we're probably going to have rain delays. And 
being from Bradenton, living there, I knew how hard concession was. So in my mind, I wanted us to be the freshest, um, you know, most, uh, you know, not relaxed. That's not the right word, but the, the most fresh team out there, not sort of at move. ease, not overdoing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it, it's going to be a mental and physical test. Um, you know, the national championship now in men's and women's golf, it's the longest golf tournament of all time. I mean, if you make it from the first day, you know, you play one or two practice rounds and then you play all the way through the final match. I mean, you're there for nine days. Yeah, it's a long week. It's a long week. And um, I I felt really confident, obviously, after us winning Big 12s and regionals that we were going to make it to that last match. So I wanted my team to be charged up and ready to go. Well, obviously, we watched... Uh, we got to watch it on television. Our team, the men's team, didn't make it that spring. We were at home watching and just saw the team just built through the week. There's the uh, the energy, and you mm-hmm. guys just played better and better. Then you got to match play, yeah. and that, that went pretty well. Yeah, no, it went great. You know, we uh, kind of getting back to how difficult the golf course was, um, we shot even par in the last round, and we were 46 over par for the tournament. Mm-hmm. So... You know, it's a very difficult golf course and and one that, <laughs> you know, I can't remember exactly what USC shot that week, but they were probably 35 over par to win it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a tough golf course. But then going into match play, we were the three seed. Uh, we got to play uh, the Tennessee Volunteers who, you know, Judy Pavone, I've known her really well for a long time being in the SEC and she always puts a, a really good team together and and but again we were we'd just come off an even par round um we'd just come off a really good round in the third round also so we were playing really good golf and and felt confident that we would uh that we would take care of them and we did in the morning we beat them four and one um but then in the in the next match we had to face duke and and dan brooks is you know he's he's probably one of my biggest mentors in this game and um you know i love talking to him i love talking to him about golf and coaching and and what he does with his teams i think that uh you and i've discussed this a lot like one of the great things about dan is you know less is more with him he he does all the all the work at home and when he gets there, he, he trusts that they're ready to go and lets them play. And so I've really enjoyed learning from him over the years, but uh, but knew that Duke with six or seven national championships at that time was going to be a real difficult task to, to overcome beating them. So but you did. We did. <laughs> we did. And it came down to, uh, funny enough, it, you know, it came down to a playoff between our five players uh five hole playoff and my player uh Lauren White ended up beating his number five player Lisa McGuire on the fifth playoff hole. Yeah, I remember watching that on television. That was a an exciting finish. And now we're all on pins and needles knowing you're gonna play Stanford the next day right. in the final. Right. So I have some memories of that final uh that I and I want you des- definitely to talk about sure. uh, uh I want to talk. I want that shot I saw in number sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could please talk about that. Well, I'll I'll uh, give you a little backstory on that shot on sixteen. The the funny thing about the whole week is Haley Davis had. I mean, she's the best player currently to ever go through Baylor. Three time All American. You know, I think uh, twenty eight top ten finishes. I mean, it's pretty amazing, right? And. We're going into number 16 and number 18 at concession. She had had trouble with them all week. She had had, she had trouble with the tee shot on 16 because you have to, you know, literally pick a line to clear the water. And she drew the ball, so right to left, and the water's on the left. So she had problems with that tee shot and the shot on 18 all week. Um, we, were, <laughs> we were 2-2 with Stanford. So, um, and we put Haley Davis out last with Mariah Stackhouse. So number one player at Baylor, number one player at Stanford at the time. And, you know, I had not walked with Haley Davis maybe one round of golf in uh, four years. 
I didn't, mean, she didn't was, need to. <laughs> didn't need to. I mean, she was very self-efficient, and, and she would do everything she needed to do to get ready for tournaments, and she was a fantastic player. And uh, so I'd walked with Laura Lenardi, who I'd usually walked with back then. Uh, walked, you know, her, her match went all the way to 18. So Haley's back on 16, and uh, I forgot who, who came up to me. I, I think it might have been Bart Bird or some, somebody's like, hey, you need to get back to 16, Haley's match is close. And so I got in a golf cart, rode back to 16, and I see uh, Mariah Stackhouse walking up the middle of the fairway, and I see Haley walking down by the water. You know, my heart kind of drops a little bit, and I'm like, you know, I knew the match was close. I go over there to 16 and Haley has a real like calm about her. She's, she's, she's found her ball. It's in the hazard, but it's sitting up really well. Um, she's going to have to stand in the mud though, to hit the shot. So it's all about, you know, trying to find a way to get her balance to, to swing hard enough to hit the shot. And, uh, her miss, it was funny because her miss was, she would overdraw the ball sometimes. And during that tournament, especially during that round, you know, I'd heard that she'd hit a lot of pretty big hook shots. And uh, she looks at me after I walk up to her and she's like, you know what, I think this is actually great for me because my feet are going to sink into this mud and it's going to keep me from like spinning out and hitting a big pull hook. And she's like, I feel like I can get a seven iron on it and no, no problem. And I literally looked at her. I'm like, you got it, Haley. Go up there and just hit it on the green. <laughs> I mean, whatever she was going to tell me down there, I was going to agree with. But she was very calm, very confident in her ability to hit the shot. And uh, I have to say, I was standing about 15 feet away from her when she hit the shot. And it never left the pin. Like, it was not only the best shot I've seen in the moment, it might be the best shot I ever see. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever see a shot that good because not only did it come out with perfect trajectory, perfect line. I mean, I've seen the replays of it. It almost went in the hole. And uh, it was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that that was that's something to moment. remember. Yeah, and for sure, under the pressure, yeah. with the situation, and the difficulty of the shot to begin with, uh, it's an amazing golf. Because she was only one up at the time, mm -hmm. she so was. she was only one up at the time, and then going into sixteen, a hole that she didn't like. Um, the 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 topping or the great thing was the finish. The putt was hard. Mm -hmm. Her putt broke maybe a cup or a little less than a cup left to right, and uh, you know I sat up there and helped her read it, and man, she knocked it right in the middle. She it did go two up and two to go. Yeah. And yeah. then Mariah Stackhouse went off. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Mariah Stackhouse went uh, Michael Jordan on us after she that. She did. She yeah. made some birdies to finish. She and, did. But that doesn't take anything away from the performance that Haley gave us. And you guys finished runner-up in the national championship. Yeah. No, Haley, you know, that was her last tournament at Baylor. Uh, would have loved to send her away with a national championship. And, and you know, I think uh, the years have made that a little less tough. <laughs> the years have made that a little less tough, but, um, you know, we would have never made it that far in the national championship. We would have never made it there without Haley Davis. So, yeah. um, I tried to over the years and she's still playing professional golf, but over the years I've tried to tell her that a million times is that, you know, you gave us the opportunity, you elevated Baylor women's golf to the point where we had the opportunity to win. And, uh, you know, again, she's built the foundation that we're going to have a chance to do it again sometime, and it's all because of her. Yeah, and she's such a sweet gal and just yeah. a wonderfully humble person. No, she is. Yeah, unbelievable. and just talented. When I saw her hit a golf ball for the first time, it made a sound. Yeah. It was pretty impressive. Sounds different, it and does. when you see her around the greens, uh, I've never to this day seen somebody hit flop shots so good she loved to yeah she loved to throw the ball up in the air and and even at concession that week um my parents were out there and they they kind of hung around the clubhouse and she hit the best flop shot on the ninth hole during the final round that i've ever seen in my whole life to you know hits it over the green has no chance hits it up there to four feet taps it in for four like it was easy yeah
Well, good memories for you, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, right now, you and your team are making some pretty good memories, too. We are. This, uh, this fall, let me just describe what you've done. You've won all three golf tournaments you've played in. You won two of them by double-digit margins, and you won the last one kind of with a nice comeback at the very end. But I want you to describe this fall from everything from getting your players back in the country, sure. which was a challenge, Yes. Uh, to the practices, workouts, how that's changed with COVID, and traveling as a team. And then, finally, obviously, great performance. Yes. No, I think the thing that uh, you and I know is that our teams, meaning our players, they never stopped working on their games. Um, even with the pandemic and even with – the fact of them going home to their home countries, I mean, they're still, not that their total identity is golf, but, you know, golf is what they do. They love golf. They have a passion for golf. And uh, something that I've been telling, you know, people when they ask about it is they never stopped working on their games. So I think that, um, honestly, when they did have the chance to get back and we were able to get, uh, into practice and go to tournaments, the enthusiasm that they had to to actually get to play golf was was definitely on our side. And I know you've you've talked about that as well. Like enthusiasm being your fifteenth club, man, they were pumped just to have the opportunity to go play golf. And I think that it has been a real challenge. Uh, it has been a real challenge in the fact that. You know, they had to get here originally, do a 14-day quarantine with a bunch of tests. Um, you know, if, if they did come back positive, they had to do a self-isolation for 10 days. So there's a lot of question marks on, like, actually when they were going to be able to start practicing again. And um, they all took it in stride. And And one of the things we talked about from day one was being ready for when the opportunity presents itself to play again. And that was, I mean, it, we didn't know if it was going to happen. And you and I talked about it all summer. Like, you know, if, <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually, you know, I said on the first tee of the, our first golf tournament in Oklahoma, I was like, I'm waiting for a call for them to tell us <laughs> to get in the car and come back home. Like I'm, I'm not really gonna believe it until the first ball's and in the air. We, we, when we went to Colonial, yeah, Coach McKellen and I were talking about let's just get this first tee shot hit so we can play. Yeah. you know, we just you were hoping and we did it this fall and yeah. you, you did it as well. You got to play. We did, and you know, I think that uh, in my in my mind, I think the Big Twelve, the athletic directors in the Big Twelve, uh, you know, especially Coach Holder and especially. He, um, Mac Rhodes, our our athletic director. I mean, they they have done everything to allow every student athlete the opportunity to continue to compete, and that's really important. I mean, there's there's not you know just the football players are getting to play or just the basketball team um, for them to be able to uh, allow all of us, and it's been tough. Like with the weekly surveillance testing and you know testing 12 hours before we leave and all that kind of stuff it's been it's been a real challenge and I I know like you guys have traveled in separate cars and you know we've we've kind of rolled the dice a little bit more and traveled in our sprinter van but you know there's there's uh so many things that that could have happened but I really I really am praising my team for doing the right thing staying safe um you know, I know that for some of them, it's not exactly the experience that they wanted their freshman year or that they wanted in college. But, you know, they've done it all so that they can play golf, which is really cool. And I think that having golf and, and having the ability to practice out here at the Billy and practice at Ridgewood uh, has been fantastic for them. And obviously in their golf scores, has been really good. Right. And you guys are currently ranked fifth or sixth in the country. Yeah. You know, I don't know exactly how all that math yeah, works, but yeah. we go undefeated for the fall. And yeah, I think well, we're fifth in the regardless country. of the ranking, you guys are undefeated. And <laughs> yes. one thing that goes unnoticed, um, uh, in college golf circles, a lot of times people don't realize it we're thrilled when you all do well. And I know yeah. you are when we, because Absolutely. it benefits both programs. For sure. So to have you guys win all three tournaments, we were able to win the Big 12 Match Play Championship. Both teams had a good fall. That's good for both teams. So I think that uh, we should start signing everything hashtag golf school. 
No, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know of a certain school that does that. We're not going to. But. Uh, you know, it's great for both teams to be doing well. And, and obviously, um, yeah, it, it just it just shows what we're doing down here in Waco and that we're we're getting good kids, good players. We're, you know, we have awesome facilities for them to work on their game. And, you know, I think one of the – the really truly great things for a golfer in Waco, Texas is the fact that there's not a lot of things to distract you away from your priorities. I think that, you know, you're going to get a great education at Baylor, which is awesome. And then to have the Billy here and to have memberships at Ridgewood Country Club, our our teams are, you know, our teams don't really want for anything. And they have a nice comforting, quiet environment to work on their game and to go get a great education. Well, I, I agree completely with you. The sentiments are shared on the men's side as well. But I just want to say personally, congratulations on a great fall. Thank you. Let's both of us put this spur this on to a great spring and have a, a great championship year. But before I let you go, Jay, okay, and I do appreciate you coming on the podcast today, before I let you go, I want to do a speed round with you. Okay. And I haven't I haven't shared any of this with you, so are you okay. ready for this? Yeah, sure, I'm ready. Okay. You play a lot of golf, Jay. What's your lowest score at Ridgewood Country Club? 62 twice. 62 twice? Yeah. Very good. You didn't shoot that in the club championship, though. No, I shot both times in the Firecracker Open on July 4th. Okay, well, at least it was a competitive event. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Shawshank Redemption or Remember the Titans? Shawshank. That a boy. Yeah. Uh, favorite PGA or LPGA tour player? Ricky Fowler. That a boy, Ricky. And, yeah. And your favorite well, LPGA? I love, uh, you know, I hope Ricky uh, gets it back, and I know he, he will. He will. Yeah, he will. He will. Favorite LPGA player? You know, the best athlete, and I really enjoy watching her play and play well right now, is Mel Reed. She is yeah. unbelievable. Uh, I watched her play in the British Open in 2011. I mean, it's a hybrid 255 yards. Yeah. I mean, did she not? She won recently. She won didn't? recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good player. Uh, you have uh, sort of a brand uh, with that you use with your beard and your sunglasses. Yes. When's the last time you shaved? <laughs> uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I need to shave my head again though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the last hole in one that you witnessed by one of your players. The last hole in one, Jordan Shackelford at um, at. Um, Albany in Bahamas last okay. year. You did see one. That's yeah. good. Uh, women hit the ball so straight, it boggles the mind. When's the last time you saw a missed fairway? <laughs> so we were actually going over stats with our players yesterday, and I, I have a player on my team currently that is 92% fairways for the season. Who is that? Nina Lang. 92%. That's unbelievable. That, you yeah. know, it it still boggles my mind. I realize they don't hit it as far as the men right. do, but to hit it as straight as they do, it ninety two percent. That's that's unheard of. Yeah, uh, you've won three tournaments in a row. Your team. How long is that streak going to last? I think it's going to continue. Yeah, we got Trinity Forest coming up on February first, second. Feel good about that. Houston, feel good about that. Well, let's just keep it going. Let's keep it going as long as you can. Yeah. Dream foursome. You and three others. Who would they be? Dream foursome would be. Myself, my dad, uh, Arnold Palmer, and probably Jack Nicholas. Wow, that's that's a pretty good group right there. I I like I started watching senior tour golf before I started watching regular tour golf. So, so you watched Arnold and Jack playing yep, in the senior yep, tour, yeah. Yep. Okay, at women's tournaments, we know they almost always have a karaoke contest. <laughs> what what's your go to song? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Sorry. <laughs> You don't um, have a go-to, do you? So right now, my team would say my go-to is uh, Watermelon Sugar, probably. Okay. From Harry Styles. Yeah, it's, I don't know what that I, is. It's not a great song, but okay. it's really catchy. It's your go-to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, final question. Your favorite Coach McGraw quirk? Favorite Coach McGraw quirk? Got to have one. I'm not very normal, well, you know. I, I, you know, my players don't really know that you do this, and and one of them saw it the other day and laughed about it forever. As you walking around with your uh, white socks on, yeah, and, <laughs> and she just thought it was hilarious that you just stroll around the building with your I, with your socks. My shoes on. aren't on right now. I yeah. don't wear shoes in the building. I don't wear shoes. Okay, yeah. that is a strange quirk. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, Jay, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are really excited to see what your team's going to accomplish this year and. Just thank you for the way you represent Baylor. Thank you. Appreciate it, Coach McGraw. All right. We'll talk to you soon.